Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to this episode where we shall continue in the series of marriage and divorce. I'm here sat with Sheikh Haytham al Haddad, who currently resides in the UK and is on the board of the Islamic Sharia Council in Britain. We have just begun talking about the issue to do with the Wali and his role in the lead to the Nikah and also during the Nikah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We touched upon the issue of the forced marriage and the arranged marriage, and I think we've covered most of the points. And we talked about it especially from the point of view of the sister. I want to ask you a question now. If the father brings a proposal for his son, yeah. and the son rejects the proposal, is it the same as if the daughter rejects it? Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. This is a good question. And again, it is a, a common mistake. Yeah? We receive so many questions from young brothers who said that their fathers chose for them specific girls. And the boys are not happy. Yeah? Sometimes the fathers and sometimes the mothers, by the way. If the son refuses, just refuses even for no valid reason. It's not sinful. Mm. The scholar said that if the parents yeah, force the person to do something that is of no benefit for them, nor the son, yeah, of no benefit at all for anyone, just a matter of control, mm -hmm. that is the son obliged to follow that or not. So some scholars said he's not obliged. Some scholars said no. We need to know if that might cause any level of harm or inconvenience, which means that he has a reason for refusing, then he is not obliged to accept it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I said to my son, okay, just uh, eat this instead of this. Yeah? It is my own preference, but it might not be his own preference. If this might cause little bit harm to him, he's not obliged to follow me. And he will not be sinful. Okay? Obviously, if I force my son, I say, you must marry this lady. Why that? Yeah, she's my choice. He looked at her. He didn't like her. This is marriage. He's not going to stay one night with That's her it. and just leave her. Okay, he said, well, um, no. Why? I didn't like her. Why? Why you didn't like her? I don't like her. Subhanallah. I am your father. I liked her. I told you she's pretty, she's good, good family. He said, I respect all of this, but not for me. Not for me. Subhanallah. You must do it, otherwise you are sinful. I'll make dua against you. Now I am sinful mm -hmm. as a father. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes we say to parents, to fathers in particular, you are blackmailing your son. Yes. Yeah, don't use this. This is abuse of power, abuse of authority. You are not allowed to do this. Yeah, and this will affect your son negatively. You don't need it. So the conclusion is, yeah, don't do it. The father might be sinful, and the son has the right to refuse. However, as I said with girls, just to go for the choice of their parents, I also say the same thing to the brothers. Mm. Go for the choice of your parents. Why? Because they will support you a lot. Especially your mother. Because unfortunately these days, because of media and cultures and whatever, there are always tension between the mother and the wife. The two queens. The two queens. Yeah. I have some, you know, casual statistics that confirm to me through the cases that I have seen that I can tell you that one third of the divorce cases are due to conflict between the mother and the wife. Mm. The influence of the mother, the blackmailing of the mother, the conflict. A minimum one third. It's high. It is very high. 
And to be honest with you, although I know that some people might not like this, in some cultures, in some areas, some countries, because they don't have big houses, I don't recommend the, the man to marry and to live with his parents. Mm. Now I am sure all parents will become angry with me because I have said this in a number of courses. You know, I gave this as a course a number of times and some parents were there. Very few accepted this and many of them, they did not accept this. You see, even if they live next door, literally, even that would make a difference. That will make a difference. That is far better. But to live in the same house where you have one kitchen, the mother is the big boss. It's her house. It is her house. And this young lady, she is coming. So she's the khila, as we say. She's an external one who came. Entered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who entered the house. Now the queen, the big boss, she wants to run everything according to her own wishes. And she feels that this daughter has, or this lady, has taken her son from her. And her son sometimes, and we will discuss this, inshallah, when we come to the issue of marriage. Her son now gives more attention to this young lady. So she becomes, you know, critical of her and the actions of her son. Now, when the son and his wife are under her supervision 24-7, then obviously... It will cause a bit of tension. Yes, it will create so much tension. But if he lives away, he has his own kitchen and his own door, and his wife stays there, she sleeps whenever she wants, she does she, her she own... She still visit his family whenever they want. Yeah, then that is far better. That is far better. I have to say this because of the amount of problems that we notice. From different backgrounds, by the way. Okay? Anyway, this took us to another discussion. The main discussion was the father has no right to force his son, and the son has the right to reject that proposal and he will not be sinful. This is the conclusion. The question I have now, Sheikh, is the issue of two men agreeing to marry their daughters to each other. Yeah. What's the Islamic viewpoint on this? Yeah, this is very common in certain cultures. In a number of cultures, in fact. What is it? The scholars called it Nikah al-Shigar. Okay? Imagine me and you are parents. You have a son and a daughter. I have a son and a daughter. I will say to you, okay, my daughter will marry your son, provided that my son marries your daughter. Okay? This is called shigar. Or I will marry your sister, provided that you marry my sister. I will allow you to marry my sister, provided that you allow me to marry my sister. your sister. Okay? Now, there are a number of cases or scenarios. First of all, if that happened as an arrangement, no force, and the mahar was involved, and they were not dependent on each other, then it's okay. So it's not the case like, if one marriage breaks down, the other one will. That is the point. Mm. So for example, brother Daniel, you have a sister, why don't I marry her? Then you might say, well, brother Haytham, you have a sister, I want to marry her. Okay, خلاص, you marry my sister, I marry your sister. What is the mahar of your sister? You might say the mahar is 1,000 pounds. I say, Daniel, but the mahar of my sister is 2,000 pounds. Are you happy? I am happy. Am I happy? I am happy. You go to your sister, Sheikh Haytham is proposing, what do you think? I'm happy. I go to my sister, Daniel is proposing, yes, yes. These are two independent marriages. Maybe there is a level of arrangement, but they are two independent marriages. That is perfectly okay. And as we mentioned, arranged marriages, as long as the conditions are fulfilled, is fine. Yes, and none of them is dependent on the other. 
that is absolutely okay and this is not called nikah hushigar nikah hushigar happens okay in the same scenario that we were talking i want to marry your sister you said no except if you allow me to marry your sister then i go to my sister i persuade her then i force her yeah or even if i don't force her i persuade her because my intention now is to marry your sister i'm not fully convinced yeah but i persuaded her because of this it's a little bit elaboration and inshallah we will continue yeah. we will continue inshallah. inshallah brothers and sisters please come back and join us for the rest of the discussion where we will continue on the role of the wali assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh النكاح من سنتي images images and depictions and depictions of our messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم have spread around the globe May endless blessings be upon thee. His life is being examined in the glare of the global media spotlight. It is the duty of every Muslim, every Muslim to present to the world the truth of his life and the excellence of his character. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy. to the universe to do this you have to know your prophet it's something that you simply can't afford to be ignorant of allah send your peace on your slave muhammad study the exemplary personality of our prophet peace be upon him which attracts people of all faiths and nationalities in know your prophet peace be upon him tonight at 8 pm and repeat telecast at 8:30 am saudi arabia on peace tv Today, one of the most common misconceptions in the world about Islam is that Islam was fed by the sword. But the noted historian, the Lacey O'Leary, has a different opinion in his book, Islam at the Crossroads, on page number eight. Page number eight. Page number eight. Page number eight. He says that history makes it clear, however, that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world and forcing Islam at the point of the sword upon conquered races is one of the most fantastically absurd myths that the historians have ever repeated annikahu min sunnati mubarak assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome back brothers and sisters to the second part of this discussion where we should continue talking about the role of the wali and at the moment in particular the arrangement of shall we say swapping daughters or swapping oh, sisters yeah maybe so we were saying that the shigar that is not allowed yeah in the scenario that we mentioned i go to you i am interested in marrying your daughter or your sister then you say to me okay you will not marry her unless i marry your sister mm. so i go to my sister i said to her listen brother daniel he's brilliant Yeah, he's perfect husband. My intention is not to find a good brother for my sister. It's to marry my sister. Yes, to marry your sister, because now there is a level of what, ah, uh, deception. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the wali is not acting on the best interest of his sister or daughter. No, there is a conflict of interest. Yeah so this is problematic the more problematic one the more problematic one which might invalidate the nikah or according to many scholars 
it considers the nikah invalid. If I want to marry your sister, and I said to you, what is the mahar? You said, listen, the mahar is you marry my sister. Mm. Or you say, the mahar, leave the mahar aside. What do you think? I want to marry your sister. Okay, fine. Khalas. No mahar for this, no mahar for this. You need to pay mahar for me because of my sister. I need to pay mahar for you because of your sister. Khalas. No mahar from here, no mahar from here. This is not allowed. And it might invalidate what? Nikah. The nikah. Now, if that happened, does it invalidate the nikah automatically? Again, as we said, they have to go to the Islamic court to decide on this because they need to confirm that the shigar, this has taken place. Because as we said, there might be confusion. It might be just arranged mm. marriage. Okay? Now, you see, as you said previously, which we see in the Islamic Sharia Council, and it is a source of problems. This scenario happened. Then I got married to your sister, and you got married to my sister. We were living happily, and it is not shigar. You have, I gave you the mahar, and you gave me the mahar for my sister. It is not dependent on each other, but it is not fully independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So now I'm living with my wife, your sister. We had problems. I'm not happy with her. Or she found problems with me. Yeah? Now she will be afraid to ask for divorce because what? She will think that it will affect our relationship as well. It will affect your relationship. Myself, I will think twice before keeping away from her because if I divorce her, maybe it will affect your relationship as well. Maybe you will divorce her. Same thing will happen. Agree or not? Agree. This is very likely to happen. And subhanAllah, this happens a lot. This happens a lot. In fact, uh, when did I come? The day I came, yeah, the day I came to record this, I had a case similar to this. And the sister said, Sheikh, I want to apply for khula. And she agreed with her husband to finish the divorce. But she doesn't want to proceed for that. Why? Because she is afraid that this will affect her relationship. She is afraid that this will affect the relationship of her sister with the brother of her husband. Her husband. You can imagine the amount of problems this will cause. And this will lead to so many other problems. This is nikah al-shigar. And as we said, it is not allowed. In some cases, it invalidates the marriage. In some cases, it can be accepted. So pretty much the last question I have on this topic is to do with the age of the girl. What is the recommended age? Because we hear many, many stories and many misconceptions about this also. Because, of course, okay. our values Allah are different to the people. Yeah. Who us. Ustad Daniel, you opened the can of worms, as they say. Yeah? This age issue is a big problem. It's not an easy issue to be discussed in a few minutes just before we end this episode. Okay? Maybe we can discuss it now and continue in the second episode, inshallah, or in the following episode. The Prophet Sallallahu got married to Aisha when she was six or seven. Got married, it doesn't mean that the nikah was consummated. Mm. They migrated to Medina. And when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq knew that his daughter became... She got to the age of puberty. Yeah, she reached the age of puberty. Then he approached the Prophet Sallallahu and he told him that now you can consummate the marriage. Okay? The West always attacks our Prophet Sallallahu that look... Your prophet, he was 50-something, got married to a lady, she was six or seven. We say, first of all, he did not consummate the marriage. They say, yeah, okay, even if he does not consummate the marriage, he consummated the marriage when she was nine. Now, this story has many lessons. First of all, that the father can marry his daughter even if she is young, yeah, very young, as young as six or seven, 
I'm talking about what? Islamic marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah? The legal marriage is something else. Okay? This story confirms that the father can marry his daughter or can wed his daughter to another suitable man. Provided that they do not consummate the marriage except not after puberty, except if she is physically fit. This is the condition provided that she is physically fit. Now, why does the father do this? See, now in the Western lifestyle, oh, they say this is not allowed, this is a crime, this is pedophilia, this is... See, we are not talking about consummating the marriage, we are talking about the Islamic contract. Why parents do this? This was a common practice in the Arab Peninsula, and it is still used in many countries, including India. I read many stories of parents marrying their very young daughters to men. They might do it for financial reasons. They might do it for protection. They might do it for the future. How? A father has, as I read once, a father has his daughter. He has cancer. He's worried about his daughter. She had no relatives, no protection. So he said to a man, okay, a reasonable man, marry my daughter. They will not consummate the marriage. He will consummate the marriage when she is physically fit. But now, marrying means what? Marrying that means that this man is a mahram for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So she will stay with him and he can see her. They can be in seclusion, etc., etc. Yeah? He's mahram for her. And he has... Because they might say, well, the young daughter is anyway, he can't see her. No, not only that. He is responsible for her, for her protection, for her finance, for a number of reasons. If that is the case, those people have done it for a noble reason. Yeah? We should not stop them from taking measures to protect themselves and their families. Of course. This is one of the main jobs of the wali, especially of the wali, if he is worried that this might happen to him. We heard of hundreds of stories, yeah, we read hundreds of stories about those girls who have been left abandoned and no one was looking after them. And then as a result of this, external men took advantage of them. Mm -hmm. In many Western countries, they measure everything according to their standards. In many countries, they don't have social services to look after girls, like the West. If the parents die, then those young girls can be looked after by the social services. And I think, Sheikh, on this point, social services, what's better? Strangers looking after the person or family? Yes, this is another social... element. Social services, whom it has been reported in some European countries that they abuse the children. Mm. Yeah? Or, as you said, Creating the family environment. Creating a family environment. And the man feels that this is his wife or his future spouse. So he will look after her. He will take care of her. Okay? So the issue is the hadith that we have mentioned, the scholars took from it that the father can marry his daughter even if she is young. Mm -hmm. Now, they said that if the daughter reaches the age of puberty, yeah, then she must be consulted. If she is young, she doesn't understand consultation. And that's why all the scholars differentiate between wilayatul ijbar and wilayatul ikhtiyar. The wali who is in charge of a young daughter, he can accept the marriage on her behalf even without her consultation. Mm. But the bicker who reached the age of puberty, she must be consulted. And this is the conclusion around this discussion or this area that will create a lot of tension. By the way, marriage for us as we defined it is a procedure to allow the permissibility of sexual intimacy. 
this sexual intimacy is happening in many non-Muslim countries between boys and girls, young people. Mm -hmm. But they don't call it marriage. They have no problem with it because they don't call it marriage. We, when we regulate it and we call it our nikah, we want to legitimize it. Legitimize it and control it, regulate it, do it in the proper way, they have a problem with it. But they don't have a problem with it. Yes? If it is done just as a casual relationship and it is not called marriage. Although the sexual relationship is taking place. Yeah? Which is hypocrisy and double standards. Completely. SubhanAllah. I think, although we've covered a lot on this point, I think it needs a little bit of at least summarizing in the next episode, inshallah. 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 Brothers and sisters, please do join us again where we can summarize this very important issue and also summarize the role of the wali that he plays in the procedure of the nikah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.